Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, seminar. Um, welcome to all of you connected online. Um, I'm Roman Dobrava. I'm the head of unit for the Innovation Fund at CINEA, and uh, I'm today here with uh, uh, a full team of colleagues uh, who will present themselves uh, in the course of uh, the afternoon. Um, so this is the seminar targeting the lessons learned from the previous large-scale call 2021 uh, that we concluded, evaluated, and uh, this is to guide you, uh, the future applicants, uh, interested parties to join the Innovation Fund with your projects uh, through main uh, points that we have observed uh, during assessing your proposals um, during uh, the preparations of these projects. And we would like to get back to you uh, with uh, some of the main findings, both uh, when it comes to uh, key elements related to the five selection criteria, uh, when it comes to how you well prepare your proposal, but also uh, in terms of statistics from the previous call to give you a high-level overview of results of this large-scale call 2021. This is also uh, a great opportunity uh, to make the link to uh, the event that we organize tomorrow, the Info Day uh, for the current Large Scale Call 2022 that we launched on the 3rd of November, uh, which, uh, to which we will dedicate uh, a full day tomorrow. Uh, so this is a sort of uh, precursor to the presentation tomorrow, uh, looking back in retrospective with what we have observed, what we have seen, and how that links to the next call. So we have a uh, quite a busy agenda uh, for the time of this seminar. Uh, in the first part, uh, we will give for you some lessons learned and aggregated statistics uh, from the current 2021 call. Uh, then colleagues will present, um, let's say, the key high-level messages, best practices from what we have seen when looking at your proposals in the previous call, what are the key uh, tips for good preparation, what were the main pitfalls, main mistakes, main issues as we saw them uh, when assessing and analyzing your proposals. Uh, we will have three Q&A sessions uh, throughout the afternoon, uh, so please uh, uh, keep your questions uh, and don't hesitate to use Slido. Uh, you see on the screen the QR code. It's sufficient if you uh, download it to your smartphone and you get, get directly there and pose your questions uh, or uh, go to slido.com in your browser and uh, the event code is hashtag innovation fund large scale call 2022. Uh, so please uh, don't hesitate and use Slido to pose your questions, your comments. We will uh, try to answer as many questions as possible throughout the event. Uh, the colleagues will uh, be answering online and a few of the questions we will address also orally during the three Q&A sessions that we have reserved in the agenda. So I hope this is, uh, this is clear. Um, I think we can move on. Um, just a, a picture of uh, the portfolio of the Innovation Fund uh, as it is today. This still does not include uh, the projects from the small scale call that we have just finished evaluating, but they will come uh, soon. So we have uh, the 17 uh, large scale projects uh, from the 2021 uh, uh, call uh, from 139 applicants, and uh, this will be also the basis for uh, the lessons learned today. Uh, down uh, on the slide, you see two links uh, which uh, uh, I can only very much well, um, uh, recommend for you to look at uh, the Innovation Fund dashboard, which is essentially the portfolio of the projects that are signed. You can look at them, you can browse through them, you can see what they are doing. Uh, this dashboard is um, uh, regularly updated whenever we sign uh, additional batch of projects following uh, additional calls. And also, uh, you can see project fishes uh, that uh, give you more information about projects that we finance under the Innovation Fund. It's a good inspiration uh, also for your preparation uh, in the uh, 2022 call. So a teaser for tomorrow. Uh, all the details will be provided uh, at uh, tomorrow's event, uh, but uh, just uh, um, uh, to highlight that, yes, the call has been opened on the 3rd of November. 
uh, the budget is 3 billion euros. Uh, uh, we have uh, this time quite a novel structure with four topics that uh, uh, follow the logic of the Repower EU communication. Uh, we have uh, uh, thus specific topics that uh, will give more space for uh, four uh, key areas uh, that uh, uh, this call will cover. Uh, and again, uh, all the details will be provided tomorrow. Uh, we stay with the same award criteria. Uh, we stay with the same logic of the Innovation Fund. Nevertheless, there will be some changes. So please watch us tomorrow for all the details. Now going back to the large scale call 2021, and uh, just uh, from my end uh, uh, to kick off the detailed presentations, uh, what we have seen across uh, the projects submitted, uh, we indeed uh, saw uh, that the quality of the projects submitted has increased, and that is positive. Uh, we do hope this trend will continue also going forward. Um, uh, we uh, observed that indeed the most critical criterion uh, uh, in the evaluation is project maturity, in particular financial maturity, so you will hear also more details from uh, colleagues uh, later on. Um, what we have also observed uh, uh, under the degree of innovation criterion um, is that in many proposals um, um, a, a more detailed explanation on the state of the art uh, against which your project competes uh, would, be benefic would be beneficial also for evaluators, would be beneficial for the projects. So please have this in mind. Again, we will speak about this later. Um, and um, one, uh, let's say, high-level observation related to consistency of data. It is really uh, a pity if you invest a huge effort in preparing a proposal and yet there are uh, numbers or claims that are inconsistent across the different documents of your application. So something also to highlight, and again, we will get back to this in the next slides. So with this, uh, I'm very happy to pass the floor to uh, Carla Benuj who is uh, our colleague from uh, DG Climate, who will uh, walk you through the uh, key statistics from the previous call. Thank you, Roman, for the excellent introduction. And so now I'm going to basically data back to what uh, you just heard in terms of the key findings uh, of the latest large-scale call. So um, the, the outline is very simple. So we're going to look at first the overall results so in terms of geographical coverage, technological coverage uh, of the different applications received. And then we'll go a bit more in depth into the difference criteria and how each application is performed, notably comparing the one that was selected for a grant agreement uh, preparation, uh, the one that would be on the available budget and the one that did not pass the thresholds and what we can learn from those results with the general conclusions on the what we've noticed as general weaknesses in the ones that were not selected for funding. So, uh, in terms of uh, overall results from the second large scale call, uh, some of the big numbers to remember. So we had in total 139 proposals that were submitted by uh, the deadline for the th for the second large scale call, uh, which of of which two withdrew, with 121 proposals that were actually eligible and evaluated, which uh, is the number you will see, and 48 that were above all the minimum requirements. Um, out of this 48, we had 17 top, rank, uh, top ranked proposals, sorry, that were preselected for a grant, uh, with about uh, 1.8 billion in total uh, in terms of uh, requests for grants, and uh, in terms of the big number is also 140 million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, to be avoidance, uh, avoided uh, during the first 10 years of operation. So in terms of the country coverage, as uh, Roman mentioned in the introduction, uh, we had quite a good one. Uh, with uh, 21 out of 29 countries that had a proposal for, for, for each of the member states or the EEA members, uh, with notably uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, proposals coming from Spain, uh, Germany, France, uh, Finland. And then in terms of uh, sector coverage, it was also quite uh, good, but we had also quite a big representation from uh, three sectors, as you can see here. So chemicals, uh, hydrogen and refinery, where we had uh, quite a higher number compared to, to certain um, other sectors in the 
that apply for the second large scale call. Then in terms of the mitigation pathways, this is something that's also quite wide. And just to, before you, you try to add up everything, you can have several technological pathways per application. This is why the numbers are bigger than the actual numbers of proposals we've received. And here you can see that in terms of eligible and, and pre-selected proposals and pre-selected proposal, we had quite a number of them that uh, selected as technological pathway, recycling and reuse. We have quite a few also on renewable power with 11 and uh, hydrogen production. Then, in terms of the application received, and I think this is one of the main points that Roman already mentioned, but that you can see here, uh, in the statistics, but we had quite a lot of high quality proposals um, and the, the 17 uh, best scoring proposal that fitted uh, the available uh, budget, um, they, they scored high on, ev on every single criteria. Um, out of the, f so we had 17 and in total 48 that passed all thresholds. So we had a further 31 proposal that met all the requirements, but could not be funded due to uh, budget constraints. Then we had 73 uh, proposals that did not pass uh, all threshold or include, included manifest errors. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the two that withdrawn, the 16 proposals that were not, um, that were deemed inadmissible and ineligible, and 17 proposals that were actually long listed for project development assistance, um, on which we will announce mid-December uh, which one it, it, they were. Now I think this is um, to to see how uh, how you can interpret the 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 next statistics. Uh, I think it's good to have uh, in mind how the evaluation actually uh, went. Uh, so we have two main steps, uh, let's say. So as I said before, we had 121 that were eligible and admissible. But then uh, you have a, a cascade principle where um, some uh, some proposals did not pass the minimum threshold and therefore they were not evaluated in the next criteria. So the first um, evaluation step uh, is the degree of innovation. And you can see here that 13 out of the 121 did not pass the minimum uh, threshold on this innovation criteria. Um, then. Uh, once you had that, uh, you are evaluated on GHG avoidance and project maturity uh, if you've passed the minimum threshold on degree innovation. And here we also had 13 in total that failed this evaluation step, uh, out of which we had five that failed the GHG avoidance requirement or made a manifest error, and eight proposals that did not meet the minimum threshold on overall, so average project maturity. But that does not mean that you would not fail one of the sub criterion. So uh, at the end, we had 95 proposals that were actually um, evaluated for um, scalability and cost efficiency. And out of those, six proposals made a manifest error on cost efficiency. So what can we learn from uh, the results? Uh, so first, maybe a, a bit of a focus on the, the proposal that were pre-selected. So uh, as I said, the quality was high, and this is even more true to the one that was selected for grants, uh, where we had uh, very high scores in all of the criteria um, of the Innovation Fund evaluation. Um, one of the good news is, of course, that many of those pre-selected proposals were resubmissions from the 2020 uh, large-scale call, um, which is uh, very good news that if you retry and you actually improve your application, you have very good uh, chances to actually be selected for a grant. Um, and of course, it's not because uh, some uh, some proposals did not uh, were not selected uh, that they were not good, because even the one that fell below the, the budget available uh, also performed uh, really well. Um, and uh, so it, for us, it's a very good sign that these proposals have the opportunity to improve uh, their applications and potentially uh, become successful in the future uh, innovation fund calls, um, except for, for proposal where you have a relatively low degree of innovation. So now we're going to go step by step into um, into the evaluation process. So first, we're going to start with uh, the degree of innovation. So 
overall, so 13 out of them did not pass this uh, threshold, but overall we find that proposal in general presented a high degree of innovation with an average of all application of 3.5 points out of five. Um, and more than 75 of the pre-selected proposal achieved a, a score of, of four or higher. And even the ones that were beyond the available budget also scored about half of them a score of four or higher, showing that, again, you have an opportunity to, to resubmit and uh, have a good chance in the, next, uh, in, the in the next score if you have not been selected for this one. Um, in terms of the scoring, what we've noticed is that the chemical sector had the most proposals of any sector score, reaching the score of five out of five, whereas the hydrogen uh, projects scored on average lower uh, than the rest of the proposals. But of course, this is to be taken with a grain of salt that this is within an, an evaluation and very specific evaluation. So it does not comment on the general even, even the innovativeness sorry, of the sector. So, in terms of the um, uh, sub criteria of the degree of innovation, um, so the state of the art and the EU policy contribution, nearly all pre selected proposals achieved a high score in both of those sub criteria, as you can see on the graph on the right, with most pre selected proposals achieving a, a very high score on going beyond the state of the art, uh, about a mean of 4.5 out of 5. Um, and even 25% of the proposal that met all threshold but were beyond available budget also scored a 4.5 or above. Um, and the 13 uh, proposal that actually did not meet the minimum threshold, uh, it was also for going not beyond uh, the state of the art sub criterion. Um, then for the policy, EU policy contribution, uh, the difference between the pre selected proposal and others is quite important, as you can see on the graph. Um, on the EU policy contribution, uh, nearly all pre-selected proposals had achieved a score of four or above, and this was not something that we've seen um, apart from, of course, a, a few uh, data points that are outside of the mean that we have seen for the rest of the proposals. Now moving on to uh, the second step of the, of the evaluation with the GHG emissions criteria, uh, emissions avoidance and project maturity. Um, here we have uh, quite a, a big spread compared to the first degree of innovation in terms of scores on the GHG uh, emission avoidance. So most pre-selected proposal achieved quite a high score on GHG emissions avoidance. Uh, about three-fourths of them achieved four or above. Um, but the spread of scores, as I said, was quite large for proposals that were not pre-selected, as you can see on the graph on your right. Um, and uh, but the but the some most of them achieved actually. Um, quite high scores with about 25% scoring four or above. Uh, five proposals uh, failed uh, on meeting the GHG emissions avoidance minimum requirements or presented manifest errors, uh, which is uh, something we've noticed compared to the previous call was uh, a lower number, which is very good news. Then in terms of the uh, actual criterion, so the absolute GHG avoidance, and the, um, and the relative GHG avoidance, as you can see here, for um, the absolute, uh, we had quite a diversity of, um, of scores. Uh, it was quite large, uh, and, but it also reflects how the, the evaluations are actually scored. So there's a structural effects that uh, should not be forgotten. Um, but for the spread for the relative uh, emissions avoidance uh, was quite uh, narrow. As you can see, there's not a lot of differences uh, in terms of uh, between, uh, uh, between the pre-selected pr proposals, the one beyond available budget, and the one that did not meet all the thresholds on the graph on your right. So in terms of the pre-selected proposals uh, themselves, um, we have quite a, a wide variety of size of projects uh, when we can um, what we can see in terms of uh, the project that were pre-selected, we have uh, different proposals for different uh, emissions avoidance um, amount. Um, but in general, pre-selected proposals do have a higher levels of absolute GHG uh, emissions avoidance compared to the other ones, as you can see, um, with a high, slightly higher on the on the um, on the graph on your right. Um, some of the pre-selected proposal uh, nonetheless still had low level absolute of GHG uh, emissions avoidance 
um, with a score between 0 0.5 and 2, but uh, they could compensate with a high score in other criteria. Um, a large number of, uh, in terms of sectoral approach, but where we can have a good learning is a large number of pre-selected proposal addressed uh, highly emitting sectors, so chemicals, cement, lime, and refinery, where the score would be structurally, um, they would have higher GHG emission avoidance, so tend to score higher as well in the evaluation. Then in terms of the big chunk where we have, um, I think the most tailing data is actually on the project maturity. So um, in general, if you look at the overall results, the maturity scores have improved uh, uh, Compared to the previous score results, uh, which is where, um, which is where the um, most proposals struggled the most, and it's not saying that they didn't struggle this time around, but they struggled less. Um, the results of the project maturity uh, so have have increased, and the maturity of uh, scores from a previous pre-selected proposal were actually uh, quite lower. So they range from 3.2 to 4.5. Um, which were the lowest level amongst all the criteria from the previous uh, selected proposal. And now we have uh, a score of about 4.1 to 4.8 on the overall project maturity of the pre-selected proposal for this score, which is a significant improvement. Um, and uh, f finally, uh, in terms of uh, sectors, what we have noticed is that pre-selected proposal with the highest maturity score tend to be from the hydrogen sector. Then in terms of the sub-criterion, so the technical maturity, operational maturity, and financial maturity, as you can see on the graph, uh, I think I, I don't need to, to spell it out, but it's quite telling. Uh, financial maturity was the sub-criterion that uh, made uh, quite the difference. Um, where um, most of the projects actually failed. Uh, so it was failed by 52 uh, proposals with a score of 2.5 or below. Then on the other uh, two uh, sub criterion, we have 11 proposals that failed technical maturity and 10 that failed operational maturity. But looking at the graph between the selected proposals and the one that were beyond available budget, um, and the one that did not pass off the threshold, but especially the two first categories, you can see that the one that was selected for um, for proposal, they, they had a, quite a, a higher, in general, scores on the financial maturity, which makes it really the, the make, make or break um, sub-criterion of an evaluation. Oh, sorry. Finally, uh, now that we've um, we've uh, gone through the first two steps, so now we have the final two uh, criteria of the evaluation: scalability and cost efficiency. Um, so, uh, as I said, out of the um, uh, out of the uh, proposal that were evaluated for um, project maturity and GHG avoidance. Uh, five failed GHG, eight failed overall, so on average project maturity. And so now we were left with 95 proposals in this um, in this last step of the evaluation. And uh, on first on scalability, we can see that most proposals achieved quite a high score on the scalability criterion. Um, and um, pre-selected proposal, uh, about three fourths of them scored four or above. A uh, proposal beyond the available budget also scored quite high, with only one proposal going below 3.5 out of 5, and uh, only one failed the scalability criteria. Uh, and even across the 95 proposals that were evaluating, evaluated, the spread of the score were low, uh, and projects uh, tended to be considered very scalable across the board. Then finally, on uh, cost efficiency, uh, all pre-selected uh, proposal achieved the highest score on cost efficiency, and they actually all scored five out of five. Um, and the proposals beyond the available budget, they were slightly uh, a bigger spread, um, but they also achieved uh, high scores, and only two proposals scored less than four on this criteria, uh, the ones that were available, uh, that were beyond available budget, sorry. And uh, out of those 95, we actually six proposal that scored zero on cost efficiency because of manifest errors, where we also know that 
as well as with the degree of innovation, we have a lower um, um, lower uh, number that uh, failed because of a manifest error than in previous goals. Then finally, for the conclusion on what are the main weaknesses on eligible proposal, I think it was quite clear from uh, the, the deep dive into each of the criteria of the evaluation. Um, but uh, the big bar is telling that the failed financial maturity is definitely uh, the criterion that uh, had underlined with the main weaknesses on which uh, project promoters can definitely improve on the future goals. Um, be, uh, with that, if you remove the, the failed um, sub-criterion on financial maturity, on average only less than 10% uh, of eligible proposals are failed on other criteria. And in overall, I think um, it's good to repeat, but in, in overall in the criteria, um, we tend to see a higher quality, which uh, was translated into higher scores and less errors in the application, which uh, is a really good lessons learned, a very positive lessons learned for the next goal. Uh, and with this, I will close uh, this uh, lessons learned statistics and pass on to my colleague, Uwe. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Uh, welcome also from my side. My name is Uwe Lutzen. I'm head of sector for renewables and energy storage in uh, the Innovation Fund unit of uh, CINEA. And uh, I want to run you uh, this afternoon through the best practices uh, for the different uh, uh, parts of your application uh, and uh, will provide you with some uh, tips how to uh, improve or how to uh, come with a, with a good proposal. And uh, I want to start with the admissibility and eligibility. Um, the microphone went off, okay, sorry. So yeah, starting with the admissibility and eligibility um, uh, part of uh, your application. So uh, our tips here are very clear. Please uh, uh, provide uh, a co comprehensive application, read carefully all the requirements, uh, uh, guidance and instructions that are set out in the call text in the documents provided. And uh, this is especially including the admissibility and eligibility uh, requirements. And uh, when you pl plan to provide an application, please start well on time, um, prepare your application, and do not wait for the last day to submit. Uh, even though the uh, application is already in the system, you still can modify this until the last day, until the call deadline. Um, there are specific supporting documents required. Um, please have a look at them and uh, prepare also them uh, quite in advance. Don't wait to the end. And uh, very uh, important is the quality and clarity. And this is way more important than quantity. So please um, come with a very good and clear application. If you still have questions uh, uh, throughout the process, please consult our FAQ. Um, there you will find regular updates and uh, you can also use the help desk uh, if anything is unclear. Please have a look uh, to uh, the uh, funding and tenders portal. There you will find uh, the, the link. Continuing with the uh, degree of innovations, so the first uh, criterion. And uh, here, um, it is. So the, the degree of innovation uh, is, a, is a very important uh, criterion. And uh, here, please uh, be exhaustive and uh, clearly underpin your claims uh, with evidence. So how to, uh, how, to, how to prepare the degree of innovation? Um, I want to uh, explain you on uh, three steps. So uh, in the first step, you establish the relevant state of the art in a very clear and in a very comprehensive uh, manner. So you describe the techni technological state of the art and the commercial state of the art um, as it is, ex uh, exists in the moment. Then you explain in details why and how 
the innovation of your proposal goes beyond an incremental innovation. Um, for this, you can, for example, identify barriers for upscaling or bar uh, barriers for combining of technologies. So to be very clear, um, here you describe what is innovative in your proposal or in case you have uh, multiple, uh, me uh, multiple elements in your proposal, how are they innovative together? together. Finally, in the last step, you provide any uh, key performance data, any evidence that you have for these claims, and this could be in the feasibility study or in any other documentation. Um, provide key performance data, provide uh, uh, any kind of uh, cost uh, production char characteristics, uh, etc., and. Uh, um, these uh, can be uh, found also in, uh, hopefully, in your feasibility study or any other documents. Also, um, go to the uh, greenhouse gas calculator. There you find uh, a sheet for the degree of innovation. Uh, also here, please carefully provide uh, the evidence for your claims. Have a clear and uh, uh, thorough look to the Annex 1, which is also describing uh, the Annex 1 of the call text, which is very clearly describing uh, the requirements of the degree of innovation. So, um, here um, you find um, a description and explanation of the different levels of uh, innovation. Um, from incremental innovation or a low, very low inno innovation uh, uh, over intermediate and strong up to very strong or breakthrough innovation just for your clarity. Um, and uh, again, please have a look to the Annex 1 of the call text uh, where you find uh, more details. Um, again, as a tip, please compare your projects to uh, uh, the existing best practice um, and use quantitative indicators uh, to underpin uh, these points. And with this, uh, I will hand over to... Hello, my name is Georgia Caroline Caroli, and I work for um, the Innovation Fund uh, team in CINEA. I'm here to give a couple of examples of projects um, uh, one that has um, successfully uh, been uh, funded because um, it is a hybrid demonstration project that you can see on the slide. Hybrid demonstration has um, the objective to develop fossil-free steel and using um, very innovative new technology. Uh, they wanted, in fact, to use direct reduction iron to produce steel and then to uh, melt these fossil free in an electric um, arc uh, furnace. And this project was successfully, obviously because it was innovative, but also because he uh, well stated the state of the art, that is the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace, and he sufficiently substantiated how this project goes beyond the state of the art. He well described the barriers that the project will encounter in scaling up, um, especially uh, all the part linked part link to the hydrogen production. It describes also all the, par the barrier uh, of the combined technology. And it was very comprehensive. And it was able to describe all the stage in the value chain, uh, provide um, very well evidence and was really convincing that their um, already existing pilot uh, reach already TRL7. In the next slide, um, that is, uh, um, we would like to show you a fictive example of a project that it might not pass the degree of innovation. In this example, um, it's a project that wanted to develop um, to build towers, uh, steel towers, with a large diameter. And they also claim innovation linked to the supply chain because uh, it's close to an arbor, and also on the fact that they are close to the, uh, to the future customer. 
this project would probably highly fail in the degree of innovation because, as a matter of example, did not substantiate well enough what is the state of the art. That uh, the wind turbine tower of a diameter seven meter uh, is a state of the art or how their technology would go beyond it. It might well describe the barrier for scaling up, uh, but um, it might fail um, to bring a comprehensive, uh, sufficient information regard regarding the design, or and once more, how they, their claim are supported, and therefore there are not enough evidence about it, and their credibility might therefore not be strong enough to be uh, success successful in our evaluation. Okay, thank you, Georgia. And uh, I will continue with the greenhouse gas emission avoidance criteria. And uh, um, so when you are preparing your uh, application and you're getting to the point of the greenhouse gas emission uh, avoidance, um, please choose and apply the correct methodology. Then ensure that calculations and reportings are aligned with the Innovation Fund's specific GHG, uh, greenhouse gas emission methodology. You have to identify the principal products, select the correct sector accordingly, uh, the reference scenario and the applicable methodology uh, must be chosen here. Make sure you use the correct emission factors uh, that apply then to your project and that they are in line with the methodology. In case you have deviations from the project boundary methods and emission factors, this is only possible in very few limited cases uh, as they are identified in the methodology um, for the greenhouse gas emission avoidance calculations. And you will find details here, uh, uh, here uh, for, uh, in the call text. Make sure that your case can use such a deviation, and if so, please document this uh, very clear and give a very good justification. Make sure that your assumptions are very robust and uh, that they are properly justified. Use the provided tools, please. Um, you find on the funding and tenders portal uh, the uh, tools, the uh, GHG emissions calculators, um, and uh, provide a clean, tidy, and organized calculation um, using the different color codes in order to visually uh, differentiate the, the cells with input data, with comments, uh, and with the calculations. Please avoid providing a full LCA assessment uh, uh, that you might have uh, done um, uh, unless uh, uh, this serves a very uh, specific reference in the Innovation Fund Greenhouse Gas Emission Avoidance Calculator. If possible, further disaggregate different parameters uh, to allow for more transparent and uh, traceable calculation, but also please keep the reference on where each pro uh, project emissions would fit into this methodology. Uh, also, monitoring is an essential part of your project. And here, please don't forget to foresee how you are planning to, uh, to do this. And uh, uh, don't forget to fill in the data traceability columns in the calculation tool. A very important point, please be consistent across all the different documents. Declare upfront the, quanti uh, the, the uh, quantified absolute and relative emission avoidance objectively and visibly in the application form, and then follow with a step by step of the calculation uh, of each parameter and reference in the cell in, these, uh, in the Excel sheet that you find on the funding and tenders portal. And then please double check that the absolute and relative emission avoidance amount that you are claiming is the same in the application form and in the Excel sheet. Please be consistent. It's an easy check. Also ensure that any greenhouse gas savings uh, uh, that go beyond the boundaries uh, are defined for your sector are claimed separately 
in uh, the tab that is provided for this. It's called uh, other uh, GHG emission avoidance. Significant or uh, significant other uh, greenhouse gas emission avoidance uh, in the range of more than 10% um, uh, are rewarded uh, with additional points, so please uh, take uh, carefully note here. About uh, a word about assumptions and uh, emission factors, um, please document and properly reference them. Um, use uh, the projected uh, operational data backed by robust, robust evidence, documented in a transparent manner, uh, all the assumptions uh, uh, that uh, are adopted to the estimates or extrapolations. In case of uncertainties, use conservative values. Disclose all assumptions in a disaggregated manner and probably reference them. And leave a clear, verifi clear verification trail. So include the sources of information that you have used uh, uh, and the hyperlinks to the original references um, and uh, do this whenever a value does not stem from the methodology where a lot of these uh, values are provided. Let's get to the main mistakes uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emission avoidance. Uh, so many projects uh, have claimed uh, additional greenhouse gas emission savings or negative emissions. Um, uh, however, uh, these were not underpinned by robust calculations. So please make sure uh, all the claims and numbers are, are adding up. The first one, uh, assumptions uh, and data adopted in the calculations were not backed with supporting evidence. So undermining, uh, uh, that were undermining the credibility of these calculations. This is one important mistake. Secondly, uh, adoption uh, of inadequate reference scenario. For example, the using of emission factors that uh, differed from uh, those uh, uh, preset already in the methodology. And um, just uh, one example, uh, do not use national electricity emission factors. Um, these will lead to incorrect emission avoidance. Please clearly look into the methodology and the preset values for this. Third difference, uh, difference in scope uh, of the reference and the project scenario. Um, for example, by omitting end-of-life emissions in, uh, in the project scenario. Um, another important um, uh, mistake, uh, project boundaries differed from <clears throat> those uh, defined in the methodology, and this uh, can lead to double counting of emission credits, uh, especially when there are multiple products involved. And uh, last but not least, uh, for the additional greenhouse gas savings that are not covered by the uh, methodology, uh, being claimed under the absolute uh, greenhouse gas emission avoidance criteria and uh, not kept them separately uh, in the specific uh, place in the Excel sheet. Next, coming to the project maturity, so the next uh, criterion. And uh, let's start here. Uh, with some general remarks um, as a best practice on the project maturity. So um, we recommend to define uh, first the project timeline. So make sure that your timeline is comprehensive, that it's realistic, and, uh, and that it's consistent with uh, all the technical and financial elements of the, of the project. Then please identify technical, financial, and operational risks. Um, and uh, for this, uh, have a comprehensive risk assessment. And uh, also ensure that, you're, that you have mitigation uh, measures, that you have a strategy that is convincing for all the major technical, financial, and operational risks. And also provide contractual evidence wherever possible for example, by letters of support, by memorandum of understandings, uh, any indicative terms uh, of agreements for, uh, for offtake agreements from key suppliers or from EPC parties um, will be uh, very helpful here. 
the maturity criterion is uh, divided in three sub uh, criteria and uh, starting with the technical maturity. So um, provide for the technical maturity a thorough analysis uh, and a technical description, but also be please concise and focus on key facts and figures. Um, the claimed expected output must be well evidenced and justified, and this, uh, for example, could be uh, that you are providing evidence uh, and performance data from previous stages of the project, from uh, pilots, uh, from other sites, um, or that you provide third-party confirmations, quotes from a vendor or supplier, for example, or uh, any signed letters of agreements uh, 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 or heads of terms, if you if you have. Um, then please provide credible evidence for any information on technical maturities, for example, a due diligence report uh, if, if, uh, if you have, and have a good analysis of the technical risks and their mitigation measures. Again, and you will hear this uh, many times today, please ensure consistency between the different parts. For example, uh, consistency between project implementation plan, feasibility study, business plan and, uh, and the greenhouse gas calculations. And um, if you applied already before, resubmissions are very welcome, uh, especially if uh, the readiness of your technology has improved uh, since the time of your first submission. And with this, I'm handing over to my colleague uh, Renata. Thank you, Uwe. Uh, hello, my name is Renata Kadric. I'm a project advisor in the Innovation Fund unit of CINEA, and I will show you two examples of technical maturity, one a very good one, and one I recommend you follow, and also one uh, not so good one. So first, uh, a good one. So here we have a functional project uh, where we are manufacturing heterojunction technology and tandem uh, solar cells. And this uh, proposal has provided evidence with the uh, demonstrated TRL levels. They have provided information on the previous Horizon 2020 project where part of the technology was developed, and also information on 10 uh, years of pilot line operations uh, providing uh, uh, 100 megawatt uh, a year. Then in terms of the performance data, they provided data on capability uh, sales production, expansion of the facility, they provided data on sales efficiency, and also levelized cost of uh, energy, so quite uh, uh, solid, uh, solid performance data in the proposal. And of course, as Uwe has already mentioned, they were uh, provided consistent information uh, across the documents in the feasibility study, business plan, implementation plan, and GAG calculator, which is very important because uh, this way you also make a much easier job for the evaluators to uh, evaluate your proposal, but also you're basically uh, providing us with the robust information and showing how serious you are with your uh, proposal. And now one uh, not so good example. Um, it's all again a functional uh, project where we have integration of technologies for uh, power to X. Uh, this proposal, for example, did not uh, clearly um, justify the TRL uh, of the electrolyzer. They just did put a number, for example, technology readiness level of six, but they did not provide information how they came to this uh, TRL level. Uh, there were no previous demonstration of power to X on which they based their project, and also they provided the wrong system operational uh, assumptions. In terms of the performance data, there were no system performance data and only qualitative indicators of uh, CO2 captures. And when it comes to the consistency among the documents, there were many inconsistency in terms of the uh, uh, measurement units, uh, order of magnitude, even clerical error, or totally different uh, figures when we talk about the quantity across the feasibility study, business plan, implementation plan, and the uh, GAG calculator. This is it. Okay, thank you, Renata. And next uh, we have a Q&A session. And 
So uh, we have uh, the, the first question, and uh, I'm uh, you do it. I can't read it. Okay, I see the question. Can upscaling the technology be considered an advancement of TRL uh, technology readiness level? Maybe Uwe, want to reply? In general, uh, yes, uh, second, third, and uh, X uh, of a kind um, uh, application is allowed under the Innovation Fund. Uh, you always have to uh, uh, describe very clearly in your application and compare to what has been already done on the ground, what uh, type of technologies are, are already implemented, and where exactly is the innovation that you are bringing, whether this is the scale or whether this is the solution. And uh, mm -hmm. the onus on describing this is uh, with applicants, so please be very clear in your, in your application. We are not um, um, uh, specifically focusing on explicit level of the technology relevance uh, level. This is not a, um, a research and innovation program. Nevertheless, uh, what the degree of innovation criterion is about is that you, as an applicant, need to justify that what you do is new, that is innovative, uh, even if you use technologies that have been already demonstrated, but what you bring is a novel, novel combination, a bigger scale, uh, or application in territories where such applications were not implemented yet. This is the case for the small scale call. So I hope this is clear. Do we have further questions? Where can we assess innovation uh, info for project awarded during the second large-scale call? Should applicants to third uh, large-scale call only consider innovation of projects awarded during the first large-scale call? Um, okay, so uh, we have uh, shown you the statistics uh, on uh, the scoring in the previous call, so these slides will all be published uh, uh, after this event, and you will be able to look at those. Uh, I think that uh, we should not be um, uh, guiding ourselves, or you should not be guiding yourself with uh, whether you apply to the first or second or not. Uh, if your project is innovative, please reapply. Uh, we, have, uh, we are coming up with the new call, with the higher budget, with new topics, uh, so um, I would not uh, restrict this on whether your project uh, uh, succeeded or not in the previous two, two calls. Okay, next. Do we have some more questions? Yes, this is a good question, uh, and uh, uh, very nice to see that uh, uh, applicants are actually reading the new call. Please watch us tomorrow. We will explain this in detail in the session Tomorrow, uh, as we have made some adjustments to the greenhouse gas emissions uh, methodology uh, and the degree of innovation, uh, and this all will be presented tomorrow. Okay. So I think we can move on with the following part of the presentation, and we move to very important uh, 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 element under the Innovation Fund, as you have seen in the presentation from Carla about the most important points uh, in the evaluation as we observe it, and the financial maturity is among those, obviously, standing very strongly. So I'll happily pass the floor to Kentan Nerinks, who will walk you through our uh, observations. Hello, so I am Quentin Rings. I'm working in the team Financial and Engineering in CINEA. As Roman mentioned, financial maturity is a really important aspect of uh, the project maturity. In project maturity, more than 50% of the project under financial are failing the criterion on financial maturity. It means that you are really to focus on this criteria in order to succeed and to be selected for the innovation fund. What are the main aspects which are failing? Which are the main aspects? Uh, voilà, here. 
The main aspect which fails under the financial maturity criteria are divided in six main categories. The first category is fails because the project is not profitable and because there is no commitments of the funders, of the shareholders of the project. This one is really important. Why? It's because under the, fi the financial maturity, we are looking to, to finance the project which are mature. It means that they are able to reach financial close. You have to pay attention that financial close within the innovation fund is defined as the moment where you have all the contracts signed, fi financing contract, but also technical contract, and that all the conditions in them are met. This is really, really important. And usually, if you have a project which is not profitable, and for which you do, are not able to prove that you have shareholders willing to invest in it, even though it's not profitable, it is probable that your project will not be considered as mature enough. It will be not considered as credible, because the probability for you to reach this financial close will be considered as not credible. The second aspect is on the business plan. You have to provide us a business plan which is credible. For example, if you want to sell hydrogen at, let's say, 20,000 euro a ton, if you are not able to provide a letter of intent which, has, which are proving that you are finding customers for this price, then it is possible that the expert assessing the project will consider that as not credible. Obviously, if in your business plan you are relying of a standard hydrogen prices, you will probably not have to provide as much as assumptions uh, as for the previous example, but still, please explain us the assumption, explain how you reach your hypothesis on your prices. The third aspect, and as you see, it's uh, an important one because it's 20% of the project which are failing for this criteria is the inconsistencies. UV has already mentioned it. If we find inconsistencies between the greenhouse gas calculation, the feasibility study, the business plan, the detailed business model, and the uh, detailed budget table, this will be penalized. Pay attention that uh, in the financial maturity, we ask you to provide us a business plan plus your own detailed financial model. We call that the detailed uh, financial model. It is actually your own financial model, and we do not provide any template for this. The template we are providing is the detailed budget table slash relevant cost calculator, which is the only uh, document which has to be used in order to calculate the relevant cost. And the relevant cost will allow you to calculate the grant amount. Uh, Furthermore, this, this sheet of the detailed, detailed budget table will be, is also to be used in order to calculate the cost efficiency. So it is a really important sheet, and it has to be consistent with all the other documents provided. The fourth aspect is the WAC. Under the Innovation Fund, we do not require you to provide us your company WAC. You have to calculate a project-specific WAC, and to do so, you have to follow the methodology provided in the methodology for relevant cost calculation. What's the goal in that? The goal is to ensure equality of treatment between other applicants. And as you have seen, a lot of, of applications have failed because they used a work which was considered as unjustified. The work is also used in the innovation fund to calculate the relevant cost. Therefore, if a wrong work uh, leads to a uh, big change in the grant amount, this could be penalized too. The risk, we has already spoken a bit about the risk in the uh, technical maturity aspect. In financial maturity, risk identification in, and mitigation is also something which is really, really important. Please do consider uh, the links with, that your project have to other projects. For example, if you are doing a carbon capture and storage project, but the storage is not in the scope of your project, you have to prove us that you will be able to store this carbon. Because if you don't have that, then probably that there is an high risk which is not mitigated in your project, and this could be, and this could be penalized. So it is really, really important 
to identify the risk linked to dependencies, to dependent projects, and to be able to mitigate that. And finally, the scope, where is your project located in the value chain? And please be consistent. That's really the main aspect on the success rate. On the financial close, what we are saying, seeing is that financial close for most projects lies within the two years after the signature of the grant agreement. And I remind that financial close for the innovation fund is the moment where all the, the, all the contracts are signed, the financial contract, the technical contracts, and where all the conditions are met the maturity will really be assessed also on the credibility for you to reach this financial close within the determined planning. On the business plan, there are several elements which you have to, to, to pay attention to ensure the credibility. You have to be coherent. We have already a bit mentioned that. You have to substantiate the revenues and the cost assumptions. And also, you have to provide a breakdown of the capex. Consider two different projects. You have one project which just give, uh, give, gives us uh, one line with the capex amount without any details. And uh, the other project we are providing us all the details of the capex with all the suppliers and eventually even with offers of indicative offers from suppliers. It's obvious that the second project will be considered as more mature than the project providing us only one line of capex without any substantiation from potential, of, uh, for, for, from potential uh, suppliers. So please, substantiate your claims, substantiate your assumptions. On the profitability, I have mentioned in my first slide that profitability was important and one of the main reasons of failure. However, as we see in this graph, profitability is not the whole story. What is this graph? This graph is actually the scoring of the, the financial maturity for the previous goal. Uh, in order to pass the financial maturity, you have to score at least three. We see in red that we have several uh, projects which have really uh, profitable, but we who nevertheless fail under the financial maturity criteria. They could fail because, for example, risks are not identified or because the scope was not, uh, was not credible, or because they didn't have evidence from what they are claiming. On the other hand, we have also projects in green which actually have a, a low profitability, or even a negative profitability, but which succeed in financial maturity even with a low profitability. What does that mean? It means that profitability for the innovation fund is only an indicator. It's in, it, it indicates the credibility that you will be able to reach uh, uh, investors, that you will be able to, to, to leverage and to get the money to fund your project. Obviously, if you have a, a, a profitable project, you, it will be more easy for you to get investors. But if you, your project is not profitable, it doesn't mean that you will not be able to get investors. You could justify the fact that an investor wants to invest in the project for strategic reasons, for example. But then, you really have to have commitment. And I speak here about commitment, not letter of intent. You have to have proof of commitment from shareholders which are willing to invest in a new project even if this project is not profitable. That's really important. And then it's make the profitability as one of the criteria for the evaluation of the project maturity. The financing plan, following for that, Please provide us the details of your financing structures, the percentage of equity, shareholder debt, commercial debt, and then you have to justify. Especially if you are using commercial debt, please provide us the letter of credit, of the indicative letter of credit from, from your, your partners. So again, just substantiate your claims, please. On the inconsistencies, uh, one of the best parties is to use your detailed financial model, which is, as I already mentioned, your own business plan, your own business model. Use the data in them to feed the detailed financial model and the detailed budget table relevant cost calculator. This 
will allow you to ensure that all the data are consistent across all the sheets. The WAC, and uh, I stress this point, the WAC has to be based on the methodology provided by the methodology of relevant cost calculator. So, and again, uh, in, I insist on the point of the WAC. Uh, please do not provide us a company WAC. Calculate the WAC according to the uh, relevant cost methodology uh, because it's really important. Doing a company WAC could really penalize you. And finally, the financial model has to cover the whole project lifetime and has to be consistent. In the cold text, you, you see that you have a mention of operational and monitoring periods of three or five years. These, what we call monitoring periods, is the, the duration for which the commission will follow your project to provide the grant. Your project, if your project has a, a duration of 20 years or 10 years, please, you have to use the real project duration in the different files, business model, detailed budget table. The monitoring period is only used to define the timing for which we will follow you and we will follow your project. But for the application, you have to provide us the real data of uh, your project, so the whole life cycle of your project. Finally, on the risk, I, al I already gave some, some examples on the risk and mitigation. And I think it's, it's an opportunity to, to provide a bit more, more example here. The storage was already mentioned. What we could also mention is an example related to, to grants and other subsidies. If your project is relying of subsidies, other subsidies than the innovation fund, but that the subsidies are not confirmed yet, it is possible for you to add these subsidies in your business plan and in your financing plan. But then you have to prove with us and to propose mitigation measure, measures. What happens if these grants are not allocated to you? What happens is fi finally these, these grants are not uh, confirmed to you. Will your project still be profitable? Will your shareholders invest in your project even if these grants are not dedica dedicated to you? All, are the, all this question has to be have to be answered by you uh, in your application because it's a risk and this risk has to be mitigated. The second example is about waste to power, using, for example, waste feedstock. Is, is, if the feedstock has to be also a bit identified. Do you have any letter of intent for this feedstock? Uh, do you have overview of the availability of the feedstock? Is there a risk that this feedstock suffer from cannibalization effects? So the fact that other plants could be installed in the neighborhood and used and claim the same feedstock, are you are doing so? Again, all these elements have to be taken into account and identified and mitigated. That's really important to assess the risk. Uh, we have provided these two examples, but I, again, if you are uh, using a market price, for example, for electricity, you have also to assess the risk that the electricity price will be less important than it is now. If you are now doing a, a business model with the current electricity prices, as we are now in a crisis, you have to assess what will be the probability that these electricity prices are maintained for the next 20 years. It's probably not, it will probably not be so high. So, to conclude on the best practice on financial, on financial maturity, we have summarized it with seven golden rules. The first of all is clearly outline the project scope, the legal structures and the interdependencies of your project. The second aspect is to provide and identify the risks. We, we discussed it a, a lot, but it's also because it's really important. Financial maturity is also a lot about risk mitigation. You could have the best business model ever. If you are not able to mitigate the risk in this business model, it will be probably not be considered as realistic. Three, your business plan has to be funded. So provide evidence of support from shareholders. And if your project is not profitable, then it's not support that you have to get from shareholders, but 
it's even stronger, it's even commitment that you have to provide us. Four, again, I repeat it, the WAC has to be calculated according to the innovation fund guidelines mentioned in the relevant cost methodology. Five, provide evidence, evidence of uh, contacts with suppliers, let indicative letters of intent, of indicative uh, offers, etc. All these elements will be needed in order to, to, to go to the sixth aspect, which is substantiate your assumption, justify them, explain them. Your project will be assessed by external experts. These experts will have to be to understand how your hypotheses are made. So do not hesitate to explain where your different assumptions comes from. And finally, do not forget to provide us the competitive landscape. What are your competitive advantage? What, how are your competitors positioned, etc. With all these seven aspects, I think you will be well harmed to, 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 to perform in the financial maturity. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Quentin. And uh, I want to continue with the last uh, sub-criterion of the maturity, and that is the operational maturity. And uh, uh, here the uh, operational maturity is clearly uh, about justification uh, of the likelihood uh, that your project will be really uh, successful and deployed as you have uh, planned it. And, uh, for this, please have a, a clear and defined strategy for, for example, offtake agreements uh, for construction and supply contracts in place. Um, ensure uh, that uh, your, the project parties, partners, uh, and contracts are well defined, and also uh, explain them, um, and provide a clear and realistic timeline uh, of all the key project deliverables and uh, milestones. want to talk about the work plan um, that you will be will develop for the operational maturity and uh, here please uh, be again comprehensive realistic and uh, again consistent so um, properly in this work pack uh, work plan uh, as, uh, associate the work packages with activities and uh, with their planned cost um, the claim budget per work package must be proportional to uh, the uh, activities uh, in these work packages. Then define an adequate deliverables, uh, uh, define milestones and uh, means of verifications uh, that will allow for an effective project management. And uh, here uh, see chapter 10 of the new, uh, of the 2022 call text for more more details as well don't also underestimate the, the risk analysis you need a comprehensive risk assessment uh, including for example regulatory risks uh, uh, and uh, risk related to licenses and you need convincing mitigation measures um, and uh, a clear uh, uh, description of them again consistency please make sure that your application is consistent between the project implementation plan, uh, feasibility study, the business plan, and other documents like the greenhouse gas calculations. Present a detailed and realistic strategy uh, to obtain all the relevant permits and licenses uh, that you need before financial close. Evidence the maturity of the contractual relationships with the suppliers and off-takers. So be here really clear and precise. Make sure also that the role and responsibility of each entity and party is clearly explained uh, in your application. Uh, choose a, a clear and appropriate role for each entity. For example, uh, are these uh, entities beneficiaries or affiliated entities or are they subcontractors at etc and uh, uh, make this very clear with this i want to hand over to my colleague carmen for an example 
Thank you, Uwe. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carmen Millan. I am Program Coordination Manager at the Innovation Fund Unit in CINEA. So I will provide you with a couple of examples of proposals as addressing the operational maturity in different ways. So I'm going to start with a project, a CCS proposal, that address very well the five different aspects that are evaluated under the sub-criterion uh, operational maturity. So let's start with the implementation plan. So in this case, the experts assess how well the work packages are described if they have a, a appropriate task with a sufficient level of detail uh, that they are well interconnected and that the proposal provides um, appropriate deliverables and milestones to uh, monitor the progress of the project. In this case, as you can see on the slide, uh, this proposal provided 12 different work packages, including the mandatory work packages, which are first uh, the work package dealing with activities up to financial close, as you can see on the slide, during the years 2021 and 2022. Then a second work package with activities from financial close up to entry into operation, and then 10 additional work packages during the operational phase, which includes uh, one work package per each year of operation. As you can see, they included clear deliverables, such as the report, a report on the storage reservoirs uh, before achieving the financial close, uh, key milestones like the grant agreement sign or the environmental impact assessment done. Also, um, uh, commissioning and testing before entering into operation, um, and for example, the start of construction. Uh, in terms of the second aspect, the uh, project management um, skills. So the experts assess how well the project management team is assess, um, is prepared to deal with the implementation of this project. In this case, a part of uh, from showing the experience of the team in CCS project, they also show that the uh, project team counted with uh, experience in coordinating EU funded projects. The third aspect is the uh, to ensure the public acceptance. So here, the proposal uh, showed that they conducted an independent survey to evaluate the local acceptance uh, for this type of technology, and they showed that they got the support from the public. Even more, they provided evidence from the support at the highest level of government in the country regarding the CCS, the CCS activities. Next is the strategy for the permits, rights, and licenses. Here, the proposal provided a credible plan to obtain the, all the permits needed in the, in the different phases, stages of the process. They even identified the legal framework for national and international laws and regulations regarding the CO2 transport and CO2 storage. Finally, the, project also, the proposal also provided a very uh, consistent uh, risk assessment including the uh, appropriate risk identification and appropriate uh, mitigation measures. For example, the proposal uh, identify the main, the critical operational risks, for example, that the environmental impact assessment would take longer than expected, or that the infrastructure might, may not be ready in time when the plant, uh, when the project enter into operation, or the uncertainties related to the uh, injection permit process. So all these risks were properly addressed in the proposal. The expert considered that they, are, they were critical, they were there, and the appropriate mitigation measures uh, were in place. Next, um, an example of a biorefinery proposal. And here, in this case, the experts consider that the implementation plan were um, not uh, sufficiently addressed. In particular, they identified that the task were too generic uh, described, in particular the tasks related to the engineering, construction preparation, and moreover uh, the preparation for the final investment decision that were, were not sufficiently developed. Also, the work plan was not consistent. So the work plan was not consistent with the timeline of the project, and some of the key milestones and the undeliverables were insufficiently identified. As you can see on the screen, uh, the for example, for the work package, uh, for the con installation, that is the construction, and can you switch off? 
So as I was saying, the work package for the installation and the operations are overlapping, while the plant uh, cannot start the operational phase until the construction has been finished, tested and commissioned, and the plant can effectively enter into operation. Also here you can see that the experts identified that the financial close was uh, taken within the first uh, few months of the project, and that was not consistent with the status of development of the project at the submission of the proposal. Even more, there were some inconsistencies in the task associated with the business uh, partnership formation. As my colleagues mentioned before, uh, the project need to provide, needs to provide sufficient uh, deliverables and milestones that show that the project is ready to achieve financial close, for example, that the supply contracts are in place, uh, of the contracts, permits, uh, signed uh, credit facility, and so on. So all these critical milestones and deliverables must be in place uh, so that uh, the project can efficiently uh, achieve the financial close. And finally, um, a, pro a geothermal proposal where the expert found that the implementation plan was not uh, consistent because um, the timing related to one of the more critical tasks was not uh, war, war, was largely underestimated, with four months just for the construction of the drilling, um, between the start of the drilling and the end of the drilling, complexion and testing. Also, the, um, the expert found that the public acceptance was not uh, ensured, specifically uh, the public resistance to fracking, and even more, the proposal didn't provide a solid strategy to achieve this public acceptance, mainly because it was based on a one-way communication with insufficient focus on the public engagement. And finally, uh, regarding the operational risk assessment, in this proposal, the, the project didn't identify the main critical, the critical risks, for example, the risk, connect, the risk connected to fracture induced by the fracking, or the potential environmental impact due to the issue of induced seismicity. So it is important that not only the risks are properly identified, identified, especially the critical ones, but also that credible mitigation measures are presented in the proposal. So with this, I hope um, that was it. I hope it was useful and it gives you an idea of how, on how the evaluators address, assess the operational maturity. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. And uh, with this, uh, we are moving on to the scalability, <clears throat> the next uh, criterion. And uh, here it's about to demonstrate you the growth potential that your technology, that your project uh, has. And uh, here, um, please, um, provide a plan for the technological uptake uh, in uh, other sites. Um, you need to provide detailed assumptions on cost uh, reductions. Um, so uh, whenever uh, you're scaling up the, the project, what uh, is here uh, to be expected. And uh, again, clearly underpin all the claims with evidence and calculations. Um, also, for this aspect, you will find in the greenhouse gas uh, calculator uh, a specific uh, tab. Uh, have a look and uh, fill uh, the relevant information into here. You need uh, to present how uh, IPR and licensing issues will be handled. Oops. Sorry, the slide. So, um, yeah, uh, maybe quickly again. So. Uh, the scalability is the, the demonstration of your growth potentials. Um, so uh, you need to have the plan for the technological uptake uh, in other sites. Um, the cost, cost reduction uh, that uh, stems from uh, the scalability of your technology. And uh, you need to uh, underpin your claims with evidence and calculations. Uh, also, you uh, will present uh, how IPR and license issues will be handled. Um, for example, uh, when uh, a technology transfer uh, will ha happen at sector level in order to scale up uh, your technology 
into the sector. For all of this, please avoid unsubstantiated or any generic claims uh, related to EU Green Deal and Repower EU objectives. So really focus on the scalability, on the potential that uh, your technology has for any scalability. And again, please be clear and comprehensive um, and um, also uh, be clear and comprehensive for communication and the dissemination strategy. And with this, I'm handing over to my colleague Bianca for an example. Thank you, Uwe. Yes, so we will um, have a look at how a fictitious um, application successfully addressed the um, scalability uh, criterion. Uh, we will we will work around uh, various aspects, um, the three axes, uh, project, uh, regional scalability, sector scalability, economy-wide uh, scalability. So let's say we have an application um, putting forward an innovative, first-of-a-kind recycling technologies. Um, in terms of project and regional scalability, um, the project addresses uh, its increasing capacity at, uh, at promoters' level. So um, what the experts uh, would consider a successful proposal um, addressing this aspect of scalability is a proposal that has specific targets um, in terms of um, upscaling and expanding its, its uh, current facility, so the facility that it has benefited from the Innovation Fund. And here we, we mean a specific target, so in terms of production capacity and also translating the, uh, that capacity in uh, GHG emissions avoidance. Um, of course, uh, it's very important also, as Uwe was mentioning earlier on, that um, all these targets are substantiated with re realistic assumptions and, and with clear calculations. Um, the same goes for, for the other aspect that it's uh, covered under project and regional scalability, which is uh, basically extending capacity at promoters level but in other locations. So again, here we, the experts are, are basically looking at, at uh, uh, proposals that are putting forward um, quantitative uh, targets uh, for, for new sites and translating those into, into GHG emissions avoidance. Um, additionally, two other um, aspects are um, the direct and indirect impact on regional economy. So a successful uh, proposal is expected um, from, from the point of view of the experts to quantify the direct impact uh, in terms of job creation, for instance. And, and of course, this has to be supported by, by let's say, experience from past expansion similar projects. And, and a good example in this sense is um, um, a project um, that is basically providing targets in terms of um, job creation by function uh, across the value chain. Um, in terms of um, indirect impact on the regional economy, we are looking um, at a successful, a successful uh, application, which is uh, clearly um, stating how it's actually um, uh, interacting with other uh, with other um, market uh, actors. So, in terms of sector coupling, with, for instance, in, in this specific case of recycling plastic waste, packaging company, research organization, um, and and other equipment manufacturer. Um, looking at um, uh, sector level scalability, um, here um, we are basically um uh, we are b basically um, talking about technology transfer uh, and capacity expansion um, across the sector. So remaining within the chemical recycling, because we, we saw that the, uh, the example is providing a first-of-a-kind recycling technology for plastic waste. Um, again, um, a successful application is, is, is really uh, providing a specific targets to expand um, um, the um, the technology to to the to the sector um, within a, t a certain time frame and translating those into GHG emissions. But uh, of course, all these um, targets and and quantification needs to be uh, well substantiated. So in terms of um, capacity, feedstock, and and GHG emissions. Um, um, additionally, uh, because of course uh, w what is expecting from any innovation fund project is that that is actually um, um, de-risking the technology that is um, that it uh, it's putting forward. Um, the experts are looking for for. Um, 
applications that are proving that there is a capacitance op OPEX reduction. So basically, there is a, a, a market uptake of that specific technology. And in this sense, again, well, projects are successfully addressing the criteria if they put forward specific targets. For instance, 10% cap capex decrease, um, OPEX um, decreases, um, and also efficiency gains during the production process. Um, uh, in terms of economy-wide uh, scalability, which is the last access in, 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 in this uh, criterion, um, what is um, expected from, from, from projects and how a, a successful application addresses this, um, this aspect is by basically first identifying those sectors that um, could um, uh, benefit from, from the technology where they are, the technology can be applied or, for instance, identifying those sectors that would, for instance, in the, in, in the example provided, uh, that would um, provide them with, with alternative feedstock. So um, here we would be looking in, in this specific uh, example, electronic industry, automotive, uh, automotive uh, industries. So those uh, industries where um, it's difficult to, uh, to, to recycle uh, the materials. Um, again, here, targets and all these um, values, so all the quantifications that the application uh, is it's, it's providing should be really um, based on, on credible refer uh, referenced uh, sources. Um, integral part of scalability is knowledge sharing. Um, and here, a successful application addresses knowledge sharing by putting forward a dissemination strategy. Um, that is actually linking uh, targeted audience with effective uh, communication channels and, of course, um, messages. So, for example, uh, really targeting industry in dedicated events, um, addressing the general public concern to, to media outlets, to uh, social uh, networks. Um, the point being that um, th the project proves that it's um, able to accelerate the scale up and market uptake of the technology. Um, I hope this kind of clarifies what, what is expected from, from such a, such a um, successful proposal. Thank you. Back to you, Uwe. <coughs> Thank you, Bianca. And uh, I want to um, point to one uh, fact uh, in the scalability. Um, as we are today doing the lessons learned, so we are looking back to the uh, last large-scale call, <coughs> Uh, we want to uh, point to the fact that in the uh, latest uh, call, in the call that is open now, uh, the scalability has some uh, new focus areas. Um, so most of the elements uh, um, were already there. Um, they are just uh, mainly new sorted uh, with, uh, with new focus. Um, we will have uh, way more details about this uh, tomorrow um, uh, during the info day, but uh, just uh, to give you First, uh, uh, quick uh, uh, overview of that. I will not go in every detail, um, but uh, new focus is uh, uh, on the scalability in terms of uh, of, of efficiency gains, um, uh, in terms of uh, future technology or solution deployment, and uh, the potential to become uh, cost competitive and financially viable over time. So um, also the potential to create new value chains or reinforce existing ones in Europe is, uh, is a new focus. But uh, for more details, please have a look uh, tomorrow and uh, follow our info day about the new call uh, tomorrow during the day. Now we have another Q&A session. And... Uh, the question: How long? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will we will pick a couple of the questions and uh, thank you very much for being so active on on Slido. Uh, please continue doing so. Uh, we are trying to answer as we speak uh, online. Uh, so uh, I guess colleagues have picked the questions that are more of a general nature, so that more people can benefit from answering them. Um, as up to 40% grant can be paid on financial close, can you please precisely explain how do you define financial close of a project? Kenton. Yes, so uh, as mentioned, the financial close is defined under the Innovation Fund Regulation as the moment where all your contracts, so your financing contract, but also your technical contract for 
for example, your construction contracts, etc., are signed. But this is not limited to the signature of the contract because it's also defined that the contract have to be signed, but also that all the conditions in them have to be met. So it's a very strict definition of financial clause, which is not limited to the final investment decision from, for, for, of the shareholders. It's more large than that. So pay attention to, the, to, to this definition because uh, the, 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 the four years, your financial, your financial close has to be uh, validated within the four years after the signature of your grant agreement. And when we are speaking about financial close, it's really uh, on the innovation fund definition of financial close. So please pay, pay attention of that. It's a really important definition which has to be taken into account in your application. Ah, yes, another aspect on the 40%. The 40% 40 that can be paid has to have to be proportional. So obviously, if you don't have any expenses of activities uh, before financial close, we will, you will not be paid 40%. Okay, thank you. I hope this was clear. Um, uh, maybe a, a word of clarification. Uh, the delegated regulation, and this is also what is the underlying basis for all our calls for proposals clearly states that the financial close must be met by four years since the grant agreement. Hence, uh, what we essentially ask for, and this was also raised in a in couple of the questions, what is essentially financially mature project for us, for the evaluators, we do not expect obviously that at the stage of submission the project is fully funded uh, and everything is signed. Nevertheless, uh, we do expect that your documentation provides very clear visibility on your pathway, how you get there by the time when you set the date for your financial close. The more evidence you can provide, the more granular um, uh, evidence is there, whether these are letters of intent, whether these are preliminary heads of terms, the more visibility you provide on how you calculated your costs and revenues, and the more they are based on solid information, the more likely it is that the evaluators will assess your project as more mature. So this is just to make it clear that, yes, we have four years to reach financial close. Nevertheless, the onus on the evaluators is to check what you propose. So the more granular you are, the clearer you are, the more evidence you provide, the better for the robustness of your claims in the application. Uh, one uh, question relates uh, uh, to the financial models, uh, the financial model template, whether it will be published soon on the funding and tenders portal, or uh, will the information be included in the detailed budget table template? Again, Kenton, maybe you can. Yes, uh, as mentioned, we, we changed a bit uh, the templates compared to the previous call, so please do not use the template of the previous call to answer to this call. Now, you have to fill the detailed budget table slash relevant cost calculator. In this document, we automatized all the calculation of the relevant cost and uh, of the cost efficiency. So when we speak about financial models, you have to fill in the detailed budget table slash relevant cost calculator, and you have to provide us the, your own detailed financial model, uh, which is called uh, like that in the, the, in the call text. So um, we will not provide other information. We will explain how to fill this document uh, t tomorrow, and we will also provide uh, uh, an explanation, uh, a detailed explanation with, uh, with video. Yes, thank you. And uh, indeed, this will be explained tomorrow. Uh, there will be very detailed, uh, there is a very detailed tutorial for you, which has been developed by our financial engineering team, and I very strongly recommend to look at that thoroughly and follow the instructions there. I hope it will answer many of your questions related to how to fill it in, what to put where, what these uh, cells mean, and it's important that you have a very good visibility on that. Uh, the next question uh, that we have uh, picked, what happens if the project is very profitable, but there is no commitment from funders yet? and it is not near, I hope, near to that commitment. So, again... Uh, yes, uh, as mentioned by Roman, 
the uh, commitment of funders and, uh, uh, and uh, financial maturity, credibility of the commitment of the funders is one of the elements of the financial maturity. If your project is very profitable and have no fir yet firm commitment, it does not mean that it's not sufficiently mature. Again, we assess the maturity of the project on the credibility for this project to, to reach financial close within the four years. If you could credibly claim to have a, a very profitable project, and if you could already provide some insight on how you want to address uh, potential investors, what's your strategy to reach investors? What's your strategy to get this funding? It could potentially be okay. It could be enough of a maturity. But it has to be taken as a whole. Again, if your project is not profitable, or if your project is profitable, but you didn't explain any risk, or you didn't, didn't mitigate any risk, and if this, this risk materialized, it seems that your project is actually not profitable, then the fact to to having no commitment from, from shareholders could be a problem, but it will not necessarily be so. So again, it's a balance. A very profitable project, it, it may be the case that you don't need so much commitment, so much proof uh, of commitment. If your project is a very uh, unprofitable project, then yes, you will need commitment. So please balance uh, the project with all the risks and it's only with a global view that you will be able to assess the maturity on the different aspects. So again, mature, financial maturity, it's what? It's the credibility of the business plan, the credibility of the financing plan, the evidence of support, and the evidence of mitigation of the risk. Another good question in high... In a highly profitable project, the relevant costs could be negative, according to the calculator. Is then not eligible for funding? The, the, the relevant cost and the innovation funds provide a funding for the additional cost of the project compared to, to the standard. So if, according to the relevant cost calculator, you have negative relevant costs, then actually you don't have additional costs and you will not receive any grant. Okay, uh, I think we can we can go ahead with the uh, with the presentation. But I would uh, also um, come back to one question that was raised there, where we were not clear enough, I think, uh, in relation to the new call, which uh, has been published on the third of November, uh, and the question related uh, to what projects applicants should look uh, at when um, uh, preparing their degree of innovation. Um, uh, claims in the in the application because the new call indeed requires applicants to look on what has been already done and funded. So please, uh, what we mean here is that you uh, should check those projects that have been funded uh, so far by the Innovation Fund and that are published on the Innovation Fund dashboard. And also you can find all the project fact sheets of those projects. So please have a look at them. And when describing your application, please compare uh, if relevant to those. I hope this is clearer. And uh, now we can move to the last uh, part, last block of the best practices. Uh, and we uh, go to cost efficiency. And this is for cost efficiency. Hello. The cost efficiency. Again, first of all, you have to follow the guidance. What is important to know is that a lower grant amount could increase the cost efficiency because it's in the numerator. Secondly, you have to be consistent. Again, use the greenhouse gas emission avoidance that mentioned in the greenhouse gas calculation tool. Do not use other data than that. If you are doing so, it will be probably failed because we will consider it as not consistent. And the third aspect, which is an important one, all the grants, which are project specific, so it could be the innovation fund grants, but also other state aid, have to be added in the numerator. 
of the of the formula. Uh, so there is no threshold anymore. It's really all grants have to be added. All project specific grant has to be added in the formula. The cost efficiency, we have automated uh, this, this formula in the financial information file, which is a, the detailed budget table uh, slash relevant cost calculator. So what is important in order to have this automatization working? Do not change or alter the files and the, and the cells. Follow the instruction. We will provide you an online tutorial, and we have uh, some introduction and explanation mentioned in the file. The third aspect is also important because it's a new one. We ask you to add the greenhouse gas emission reduction in the file of a detailed budget table. Do not hesitate and do not forget to do that because if you are not doing that, you will not be able to calculate the cost efficiency criteria. Fill the file completely. And finally, uh, again, be consistent. I know we, we, we insist a lot on the consistency during, during the session, but really, we have, we have seen too, too many projects which a lot of inconsistencies in it, uh, and we do want to, to, be, to, to have less uh, inconsistent uh, proposals applied. It means that cost efficiency is now simplified, provided that you fill the detailed budget table completely. Voilà. It will be explained in tomorrow again, and uh, we will get a tutorial for that. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I think we, we have uh, run through the slides uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for preparing your application uh, under the next uh, call that is opened, uh, based on what we have seen in the previous applications. But let me, before going to the final slides, just uh, show maybe on the screen those slides that uh, I would recommend to you to, re to look again uh, at, because uh, I think they include a lot of information, which also is difficult to go in, in very much detail in event like this. Nevertheless, they are very important if you want to improve your chances for success. Um, and these are exactly those examples where um, we have tried to put together um, uh, some of the... Now I'm a bit lost on the... Yes, okay. On, on the key uh, elements that we have seen uh, as uh, difficult in the applications, uh, difficult for the experts to, to assess. Uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, they uh, are based on practical projects that we have seen. But here, you see them very clearly on the slides on the degree of innovation. Uh, please have a look again uh, at the upper part that shows you the key elements that are really necessary for a successful project to be addressed. Uh, they were presented today, and this is a good example. While here you have a bad example, so what was missing compared to what should be there. The more uh, you describe, the, the more you go in detail, the more you focus on uh, short but very, very clearly uh, stated sentences that are underpinned by data by feasibility study in the case of degree of innovation, the better for you and the better for the project. Uh, on the greenhouse gas emissions, I think that uh, Uwe has given you a very good overview of the key issues. Uh, I believe with the very clear guidance that uh, has been developed for the next call that will be also presented tomorrow. Again, uh, we should be all able to address this and we also see dropping numbers of projects failing on this because of the mistakes in calculation. So please, again, watch us tomorrow on this one because a, a more detailed explanation will be provided by colleagues from the JRC. Um, on project maturity, I think if you keep in, in your head this picture, uh, this, this shows it all in a way. Um, how well do you, do you know your project? How well do you understand the risks? how well you place them and how well you understand how they can be addressed, whether they are financial, whether they are operational or technical. This is, I think, the, the common thread that connects the elements 
under the project maturity in different colors, as, as you see, but it is a question of consistency and the way how they click together, the technical, the financial, the operational maturity. If you are very clear on this, if you are uh, convincing in your application, and again, based on data, calculations and information, the better for the project, the better for its chances. And again, examples that were provided, please have a second look at them. They will stay on the slides. Those things that are important for us, for the evaluators, uh, uh, compared to those where they were clearly missing, they were unclear, they were not underpinned by evidence. Uh, very, very clear message, I hope, to everyone. On the financial maturity, I hope uh, Kentan gave you very detailed and thorough overview on the issues. Don't uh, think that if your project is not profitable enough that it will be rejected automatically. Don't count if your project is extremely profitable, it will be automatically accepted. Uh, this is all uh, the function of elements that describe how well the project is prepared to be funded whether it is from its financial setup, whether it is from its contractual setup, make sure that they, again, click together and you provide a coherent story in your application. We gave you some explanation on the expectations that are clear. They are also defined in the context. And where do we look, where the, the experts will assess your project? They all base the assessment on what you provide, on how well you describe, how well you substantiate and underpin your claims with data, with calculations, with expectations. The better you are able to explain this, the better for the evaluation of the project. And then uh, we walked you through, uh, again, a couple of additional examples related to operational maturity, scalability, and so on. So please have a look at these. They are there for a reason. We have really tried to pick those elements that are essential for the evaluators compared to those elements that were missing in the applications. So I invite you all to have a second look. The slides will be published and available for your reviewing. So going to uh, the final recommendations that uh, we, can, we can provide uh, uh, to you, uh, again, uh, based on what we have seen in the previous calls, in the previous evaluations, um, very often it is a question of consistency. Uh, how well you are able to provide a story that is consistent, that links different elements of the project. We are always trying to see a project as a whole, as an entity that has different elements, and the better they are connected, the better for us, the better for the evaluators, the better they understand what you are actually trying to do. The question of being realistic versus uh, being speculative, I, I think it's very important to to be clear on this one, the more realistic your project is, the less language, the less words you need, uh, the more targeted your language is, the more it is uh, uh, um, uh, closer to the, to, the to, the, to the evaluators, it is easier for them to assess, to read, to score your proposal. So please keep your projects in the realm of realistic world. Uh, uh, write about things that you know and uh, uh, base uh, your, your, your claims on, on real data and evidence. Uh, the clarity of the proposal, uh, also very, very important element in many cases. It was very difficult to understand, in fact, how the project will be organized, how the different parties will cooperate, what will be the different roles and responsibilities, uh, how the different elements of the project, again, link together. So the clarity of the language, again, relates to realistic expectations and the consistent presentation of your proposal. Please have this in mind. Um, uh, we are not really looking for scientific excellence here. We are not looking for uh, uh, beautiful pieces of literature. This is a very dry process based on qualitative and quantitative indicators, and the more you are to the point in the proposals, the better, the better for the evaluation, the better to assess your claims. And again, the question of um, um, parties that are involved uh, in your proposal, um, make sure that you have uh, agreed on the key expectations with your partners uh, that you are applying, 
this makes again the proposal uh, uh, more credible. Uh, it, it makes it easier for you to present what the different roles and responsibilities are, are, what are the inputs and outputs to the project, what are the external factors potentially that may influence you, and how are you ready to address them in your in your project. Make again the the, the helicopter picture on yourself, on your project, uh, uh, to understand also the surroundings, how the project is located, how does it depend uh, on other, uh, other elements on the market, and try to describe that in a very, very consensual way. So I think this is, a, uh, this is no uh, a rocket science. I would say these are very, uh, very easy uh, uh, um, uh, lines of advice. Uh, uh, but very hard uh, to, to implement in practice once you start drafting your project. Uh, but it, it does make sense to, to, to think about these um, elements before you actually uh, put all your energy into preparation. Uh, as, as there is a saying, don't lose the sight uh, of the forest because of individual trees. That is our message here. The project as a whole needs to make sense. The elements are there. To, to, to make the full picture if one of those is missing and you forgot about the others, then the presentation is difficult to, to finalize. It's also difficult for the evaluators to assess. So please have this in mind. It does make sense that the project is presented as an entity that is whole, that is well presented across the criteria that are defined in the call text. And with this, I think we are reaching the last part of the questions and answers. So we will be still able to collect a couple of questions and we'll try to address them. So on project maturity, is it possible to apply even if exact consortium composition uh, is not yet final? Uwe, do you want to take this? Yes. Um Put yourself into the shoes of the experts that are evaluating your proposal. And you need to explain to them very clearly what are you planning to do and how are you planning to achieve the goal that you are proposing here. And uh, maybe that uh, gives uh, by itself already a very good answer to this. Of course you can apply, but you need a very good reasoning why specific parts are not clearly defined yet. If you have a good uh, reasoning for that, because something is happening very late in the, pro in the, in the proposal, in the project uh, timeline, and uh, you will uh, define uh, s certain things later, then um, this uh, might be, um, uh, yeah, you, you need very good reasoning for that. But in general, the project partners should be known and well defined uh, from the beginning uh, also, as they will uh, participate on the project financing and uh, they will benefit <coughs> from the grants. So, therefore, um, when you are planning to apply for a project, please make sure you know who is involved and who, who has which part uh, in this proposal uh, with a very good definition <coughs> and a very good um, justification for it. Okay, how large can the financial gap be at the application to still be evaluated positively, provided that the gap will be covered before the financial close? Kentan, would you? Yeah. So what is required is to provide enough evidence to ensure that the gap will effectively be covered before financial close. So at application, you don't have necessarily to close this financial gap, but you have at least to provide, to provide us a strategy leading you, uh, allowing us to understand how you will effectively get this gap at financial close. Again, it will also be linked with the other element of financial maturity. If you have a profitable project, probably that this gap will be less difficult to reach than for an unprofitable project. If you, it, it is the same for a risky project or a de-risked project. So it's all in all. So the financial gap, in other words, 
can be large if you have a really profitable project which is not risky. If you have an unprofitable project which is very risky, probably that the financial gap will have, have to be very uh, slow. Yes, and, and in essence, uh, what we look at, um, uh, at, the, at the point of submission is to what extent your project has chances to cover that gap until financial close. So what is your strategy? What is your expectation? How well did you think about this? And how well did you document this in your, in your data in the project? Okay, next slide. Next, next question. <laughs> Is it sufficient to describe the relative scenarios or should it be absolute always, i.e. describing energies even if only one type of energy is optimized? That's quite a difficult question to answer. I guess it relates to the, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, avoidance criterion. Um, uh, by definition, you need to present both the absolute and the relative emissions uh, by following the methodology. Why? Because they are uh, specific sub-criteria under the greenhouse gas emissions criterion, they are scored. So yes, please uh, follow the methodology there. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, your reference scenarios need to be explained so that your project scenarios are tangibly calculated. How long does it take to announce results in the first payment to be made? Um, well, we are trying to be as fast as possible in announcing the results. I, I hope that uh, um, th this is also what you observe. Normally, uh, we are within six months uh, to announce the first results. Uh, and when the first payments are done, this is always project specific uh, because it depends on the disbursement schedule that is negotiated during the grant agreement preparation. And this reflects the dis disbursement framework of each and every project. Some projects are faster, some will take longer because they have longer financial close. So again, this will depend on your particular case. Okay, this is a very good question. I think um, uh, you mentioned having good memoranda of understanding would benefit project maturity. In hydrogen projects, it may be hard to have MOUs with prices. How can one score better on the financial maturity here? And uh, maybe I would ask Kentan uh, again, or? Yeah, no, no, no problem. So again, all depends on the, the credibility of, uh, of your assumptions. If uh, you rely of, on a hydrogen price, which is comparable to the standard price that the hydrogen is sold at the moment, then the probably that you will don't have to, to substantiate that a lot. But if you mention that in order to, to make your project profitable, you have to sell your hydrogen at 20,000 euro, then yes, you will have to provide substantiation for that. Because if you are not able to provide any indication that you are effectively be able to sell the hydrogen at this price, then it will probably be considered as not credible. Uh, so, Again, financial, financial maturity has to be seen as a whole. Uh, it's not only about one uh, element, it's about the globality, the profitability of the project, the commitment of your shareholders, the credibility of the of your business plan, and the way you address the risk. If these four elements are, are considered as credible, if these four elements are, are developed and justified, then you will be able to score under financial close. But indeed, if you provide some assumption on a hydrogen price, which are far above the standards, then if you don't substantiate that, you will be penalized indeed. Yes, so indeed, in many cases, you will not be in the position at the submission to come up with full, fully fledged contracts and memoranda of understanding. Nevertheless, uh, when you are calculating your revenues and costs, you are basing this on certain assumptions and they need to be underpinned by uh, a document, by an evidence on which this is done. So if you are calculating your future prices, uh, I guess you will have a certain model. Probably you will have a pre-agreement with an off-taker that will give you a range of costs in which you will be operate. 
So the more clear here you, you will be, the better, obviously, for the evaluation. A good question related to public uh, support. Uh, please clarify, should national public project specific support be deducted from the eligible support from the Innovation Fund in the criteria cost efficiency? Yes, hello. that's a difference from the previous call. Now the um, national public project specific support are added to the Innovation Fund grant in the cost efficiency. This is automatic, so you don't have to do anything. You just have to fill in completely the detailed budget table slash relevant cost calculator. Yes, and again, uh, we will we will speak about this tomorrow at the at the info day, and uh, there is a very detailed and very good uh, tutorial for you prepared, uh, where that will guide you through uh, the Excel calculation. Is there not a paradox between scalability innovation? Uh, no one would start a project before having seen a smaller scale first. Then the innovation is lost. Um, this is um, uh, an interesting question, but. Um, Again, I, I would come back to what the purpose of the Innovation Fund is, and that is to deploy and upscale uh, the solutions on the market in real commercial operation. So um, I wouldn't see this as a paradox, but rather a necessity. If you want your uh, innovative technology to be successful on the market, at a certain stage you come and start upscaling it, replicating it, and this is exactly what we are looking at under the scalability criterion. Um, and the more you can base your expectations of growth on something that has been already tested or piloted, uh, the better, because then also your expectations are more uh, related to evidence and real information that you have. So I wouldn't see this as a, as a paradox. Uh, it is indeed uh, rather a, an evolution. Uh, you start smaller, and if your project is successful, you are growing. And this is exactly what we are trying to support with our criteria, with the Innovation Fund. Now, looking at colleagues, whether we have more questions that we can still address. And we should close. So yes, uh, I, I think we can we can come to to a closure. Uh, nevertheless, we still stay online uh, for some time, uh, and we will still try to answer your questions uh, that you have uh, posted. Uh, um, because yes, we are full room of colleagues here who are trying to answer. Um, we would like to ask you for a feedback. So please uh, go here and uh, address the questions uh, in this uh, poll um, uh, on Slido. Uh, we are very always, always very interested to collect uh, 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 the feedback from stakeholders and applicants. Uh, this is important for us to improve and address our future events and material that we are preparing for you, uh, also to increase your chances for a preparation of good proposals. So please go there. And um, finally, what is ahead of us? So tomorrow we will uh, we will meet again at the info day for the 2022 large scale projects call um, that will last the whole day. Uh, in the morning, we will give you uh, the the first overview and presentation of the call of the criteria. In the afternoon, we will have a deep dive presentation related to greenhouse gas emissions and financial aspects of projects, so please uh, uh, watch us tomorrow. This will be a rich uh, seminar that I hope will give you enough uh, information for uh, a good preparation of your proposals. All the materials that we will be presenting will be made available for you. They will be available on the websites of the Innovation Fund. You will see all the slides from this seminar, but also from tomorrow's seminar. All the video and material that will be prepared will be posted for you for your later reviewing. 
Then uh, on the 19th of February, uh, we are working uh, uh, on, the, on the conference, um, uh, financing innovative clean tech uh, solutions, uh, which will be held here in Brussels and online. Uh, so again, please watch the space uh, uh, where the information will be provided about this conference. Um, and uh, uh, it will be also possible to follow the presentations there. This will be a space where we would very like to also present the next big projects from the 2021 large-scale call and uh, have a, a sort of a ceremony celebrating the signature of their contracts. Then um, an interesting event on the 8th of February where we are uh, trying um, together with um, uh, European Commission uh, uh, other departments uh, also in the agency to um, make justice to uh, synergies between different programs that we are funding. It's not uh, always straightforward, but what we are trying to do here is to link uh, the Horizon uh, uh, 2020 Horizon Europe with Innovation Fund and see what synergies are there. This is in particular uh, an event opened for uh, uh, Horizon uh, 2020 and, and Horizon Europe projects, but also other RNI projects that would have um, uh, an interest to apply to the Innovation Fund. So, in, in essence, to continue their journey from RNI towards commercialization. So, this will be um, a specific event for that. And on the 16th of March, we will close the 2022 large scale call. Uh, so, again, this will be presented tomorrow. That's the deadline for submission of proposals. And so where can you find more information? As always, uh, just Google Innovation Fund and it takes you where it needs to take. Uh, there is a, a lot of material on DG Klima's website, on Cinea's website, uh, so please watch us online, follow our posts on, uh, on, on LinkedIn, on YouTube and so on. Uh, we are trying to be as transparent as possible and as uh, timely as possible. Okay, and I think this brings us to, to the end of the session. Uh, it ran incredibly fast, uh, at least uh, for us here, uh, but we, uh, we still stay online uh, for you and we will still uh, answer some of your questions that you have put on Slido. Um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was useful. Um, uh, and uh, don't hesitate to come back uh, to the slides that were presented. If you have any project-specific questions uh, that you will face during preparation of your proposal, uh, we will open the help desk for you uh, and uh, we'll be able to answer those uh, specifically uh, through this help desk again tomorrow. You will hear all the details about that and how to use that function will be presented to you tomorrow. So with this, I would like to thank uh, to all the colleagues whom, uh, who are not visible but still very busy here in the room uh, for the preparation. Uh, I thank you for your attention, for being with us today, and I wish you on behalf of the team here uh, all the best and uh, good luck for the preparation of your future projects. Thank you and goodbye.